We are in a, in a series on Titus, and we are in chapter 2, and over the past three weeks, we have been looking specifically at how the gospel applies to aspects of our life on a very ground level, so whether it be men or women or workers. And this week, we're actually going to take a little bit of a step back and look at some context. And, and really, what I'm going to say is going to be so obvious is you're going to kind of go, well, duh. But I don't want you to miss a very important piece here of this chapter. And that is that the context of chapter two, really the, the whole letter, is that these things are taking place in the local church. Well, duh, right? Titus is, is written to a young leader who is supposed to be instructing churches. But here's the thing. I think we can, we can look at something so obvious and miss the fact that this is absolutely essential to our discipleship. And so we're going to look just a little bit more today at the importance and actually the centrality of the local church. So if you're here and you're new, you're a guest, and you're, you would say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but I'm, I'm still kind of figuring out this church thing, or I'm looking for a church home, I'm really glad you're here. I want to welcome you into this conversation as we wrestle through what importance the church plays in our discipleship. And if you're here and, and you're a skeptic, you wouldn't claim to be a, a follower of Christ, but you're wrestling through who Jesus is and what this church thing is all about. I'm also really glad you're here because we're going to talk about some things related to the church that I hope you will find that this place is a very open and safe place to wrestle with questions and to ask questions. So we're going to have some fun this morning looking at the centrality and the importance of the local church to our discipleship. Now, I want to throw a quote out at you and see what you think about this. So in the third century, there was a a very prominent church theologian who wrote, you cannot have God as your father without having the church as your mother. What do you think about that quote? As good evangelicals, we probably push back against that quote because what it sounds like, it makes it sound as if church membership is more important to salvation than your actual relationship with Jesus, right? Maybe if you're here and you're not a Christian, you think, well, that sounds like a typically arrogant Christian thing to say. But I think there are things in us that kind of push back against that, and with good reason. Some churches have actually, church traditions have actually taken that quote and used it to try to argue that if you leave that specific tradition, you're actually not a Christian, but I think there's something else that kind of pushes back against that quote in us. Culturally, culturally, one of the fastest growing demographics are what is known as the nuns. Not nuns as in Catholic nuns, but nuns as in no, none. And what these This demographic claims is, yes, I believe in God and I even have a form of spirituality, but I don't identify with any particular faith tradition. I don't identify with a particular church. And so culturally, we we have this sort of mindset that we can be spiritual, we can have a relationship with God apart from a community. And then also, I think within specifically American culture, we have a whole host of parachurch organizations. So whether it be high school ministry or campus ministry or certain men's and women's fellowships or organizations like the Navigators. And and many of us in here have benefited from such ministries. I myself have as well. But the thing is, is that in finding a lot of benefit and good from those organizations, oftentimes what happens is we'll detach ourselves from the local church and, and just put all of our sort of our eggs in one basket with that. Now, I'm not disparaging parachurch organizations at all. They have a very important role to play, and they're doing very good gospel work, and I know some of you work for them. But here is the thing. Here's the thing, and I want want to frame it in a very stark way to make a point here. If tomorrow all of the parachurch organizations in our country and throughout the world cease to exist, mission and discipleship in this world could still and would still thrive. However, if the church ceased to exist tomorrow, mission and discipleship in this world would be dealt a fatal blow. That's, I want to push that strongly against us this morning because I want us to see just how important the church is in God's plan for us. 
And so here's the, the main point that I want to get across to us. This is the big idea that I'm going to push on us this morning is this, is that God's intended context for discipleship is the local church. And that's what Titus 2 points us to. So we're going to look at sort of three big categories uh, today, this morning, to, to, to unpack this idea. And that is, first, we're going to look at the centrality of the church, then we're going to look at the complexity of the church, and then the beauty of the church. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a number of passages. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be moving throughout uh, Scripture. So please turn to Exodus chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I just want to set a little bit of context. The Bible is a grand narrative. It's a story of redemption. God has been about saving sinners. Those who have rebelled against him, he has been about saving them and bringing them back into relationship with himself. But here's the thing. God has been about saving a people. It's plural. And so what I want to look at is and show how scripture puts this emphasis on that God is saving a people. So in Exodus 6, the context is God is sending Moses into Egypt to call out the people of Israel. And this is what Moses says, or this is what God says to Moses to tell the people. This is in verse 6. So Exodus 6, verse 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. So God is going to rescue Israel from slavery, not only political slavery, but also spiritual slavery. He's going to call them out from the sin of the Egyptians. And this is the beautiful thing. He says, I am going to be your God and you are going to be my people. Ownership. God is going to take a people unto himself and he's going to commit himself. He's going to give himself to a people. So I want you to see the wonderful relational language in that statement. God is after and saving a people and he's going to give himself to that people. Now flip over to Exodus 19. Just a few pages over. Exodus 19. And we're going to look at verses 5 and 6 in Exodus 19. Pay attention. Similar language that God uses here. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Again, you're mine. You belong to me. But notice the plural language there. A kingdom, a nation, a people. So God is after a people. He is saving a people to call to himself. Now what is really awesome about the narrative of scripture is what started with the nation of Israel, God extended to the whole world. It wasn't just Israel that God was going to be in a relationship with. He was actually going to bring people from all nations, tribes, and tongues, as the Bible says, to be part of this people he was saving. So flip over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I want you to notice something about this language. See if it doesn't seem familiar. Chapter 9, or excuse me, chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Does that language sound familiar? It's the exact language of Exodus 6 and Exodus 19. What God said of Israel, what started in Israel, has now been applied to the church. God has called out sinners from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He has saved them. He has saved them from their sin and their rebellion and brought them into a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. So this is us. We are his people. He has called us to himself. We are his possession. And this is what God has been about in history, saving sinners. Now, look at, if you flip back to Titus 2. I told you we we're going a lot of places here. Titus 2 the end of chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, even Paul picks up on this language of possession and people. Starting in verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
who gave himself for us to redeem, for, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I could go on and on and on all throughout scripture. The message is God's saving work is after a people. So the centrality of the church in salvation, God would save a people us and bring him into bring us into a relationship with him now i love the way that the 20th century pastor and theologian john stott puts this he writes the church lies at the very center of the eternal purposes of god it is not a divine afterthought it is not an accident of history on the contrary the church is god's new community for his purpose conceived in a past eternity being worked out in history and to be perfected in a future eternity, is not just to save isolated individuals and so perpetuate our loneliness, but rather to build his church that is to call, that is to call out of the world a people for his own glory. When you think about the salvation that God has accomplished in Jesus Christ, I hope you see he's saving a people. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just God saves a people and brings them to himself. There's, there's more to it. The church is also central to God's purposes and mission. At the end of verse 9 in 1 Peter chapter 2, there's, something of, there's a very, very important statement that Peter makes. You don't need to turn there, but, but he says all of these wonderful things about who we are in Christ, this chosen generation, holy, royal priesthood, holy nation, and God calling these people to himself to possess them. And then there's a really important phrase there, so that, so that, so that what? So that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have a purpose. God didn't just call us to himself and we just kind of sit around and go, oh, this is great. Salvation's cool. No, he called us to himself so that we may go out and proclaim the gospel to the world. And that is the method that God has chosen to proclaim who he is, through the church, through us, through his people. And then I love the way that Ephesians 3 talks about it. It says the church is the wisdom of God. It says the way that God has chosen to put his wisdom on display so that the world, whether it be the physical world or the spiritual world, may see that God is wise and his plans are wise. What are you supposed to point to in the world of all the things we could point to? Ephesians 3 says the church we display the wisdom of God. We proclaim the wisdom of God as a people. And Titus chapter 2 also hints at this and pulls on this idea. We talked about this last week at the end of verse 10. When we live our lives and live our identity out as those that belong to Christ, we display, we adorn the gospel in this city. People see the effect that Jesus Christ has on our lives, and through that we proclaim the gospel. So God is working in the church. He saves a people, and he sends them on mission. So the church is central to God's purpose in salvation and mission and discipleship. In the context of Titus 2, we have a church. We have the gospel being preached, sound doctrine. We have elders and leaders that are teaching it. We also have a community that lives among one another and disciples one another. That's a church. Now, flip over to Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, we sort of have a blueprint of how discipleship in the church is to look. This is sort of what is kind of overlaying the top of Titus and kind of the the inner workings, the dynamics of what's happening in Titus 2. So if you go to Ephesians 4, starting in verse 11. Listen to how discipleship in the church works and listen to how it is a manner of a plurality of people. So starting in verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, 
speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. He says a lot here, but here's the essence of what he says. God gives leaders and teachers to the church and they teach and equip the saints, but who's doing the work? The saints, all of us. All of us do the work of the ministry. And as we do that, what happens? We grow together in unity and love and maturity. As we serve together, as we grow in our understanding of the gospel, something happens to us together. And we grow in the fullness of Christ. We serve together. So let me frame it this way. You will never be as mature as you could be or want to be apart from the context of the local church. So I played basketball in high school and a little bit in college. And so now when I, I, I love basketball and when I go and play now, so the apartment complex has a hoop and I go and I'll shoot hoops by myself and I'll, you know, I'll try to do a lot of the same things that I used to do. And while I'm by myself, it goes great. You know, I'm, I'm knocking down three-pointers. It's great. I'm crossing dudes over in my mind. You know, it's, it's just like the old days. But you know what would happen if I go and play in a game? My evaluation of where I am changes completely. There are gaps in my game, significant gaps in my game that I don't recognize until I'm playing with other people. It's the same thing with discipleship. You may think you are mature. You may think you are godly. You're patient. You're loving. When you're by yourself. But once you're in the church, you start to see, wow, <laughs> there's some gaps in my discipleship. So let me, let me frame it out this way. Titus 2. Men, you will never be as sober-minded, dignified, self-control, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness apart from the local church. You may grow some, but you will never grow up in the fullness of Christ. You'll never grow to the fullness that God intends for you and even the fullness that you probably want and wrestle with on a daily basis. You'll never grow up apart from the local church. Ladies, apart from the local church, you're never going to be as reverent, as kind as you could be. Wives, in following your husbands and loving them and serving them, it's never going to be as deep and as mature as it could be. As you love your kids, you're never going to grow in the fullness of what Christ has for you in maturity apart from the local church. You may grow some, but you won't grow into the full maturity that God has intended for you apart from his context. The thing is, we need each other because God's designed it that way. It's not some kind of codependency built on, I need people to like me. No, it's that God has designed the church to be this beautiful picture of us loving and serving and growing up together, helping each other. We all have blind spots, no? And I need people to see my blind spots and speak into that and help me grow. That is God's intention for discipleship. The church is central to the purposes of God in discipleship. Now, I'm pushing on this because we're, in our culture, we are so prone to reading passages of Scripture individualistically. Like, when you read 1 Peter 2, and you see that you there, how do you read that you? See, English is a funny language, and I think in some ways it reinforces our individualism because we use the same word you whether speaking singular or plural. In many languages, they're different words. In the Greek, they're different words. So when I read this and I say, you are a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood, you are God's possession, I read that and I go, oh yeah, me. 
But really, it should be, oh yeah, we. Now, yes, God loves you. His love is particular, and his love is personal. He loves you singular. But don't miss that his love for you singular involves bringing you into a you plural. That is his design for you and his intention for you. And we do this with a lot of passages. So be careful about reading the yous and the other passages overly individualistically. See God's love for you, yes. But then see God's love for his people. The centrality of the church in salvation, mission, and discipleship. That's what Titus 2, the whole book of Titus, shows us. Now, you may assent to this. You're like, yeah, Chris, I get it. I see this. I believe you. You convinced me in scripture. But, man, being the church is hard. Living in community is hard. It's why we reduce church to just showing up to an event oftentimes because actually being in community is really hard. And you know what? You're right. You're absolutely right. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you two reasons why living in community will always be hard. The church is complex. And we have to be, we have to be honest about this. We have to admit it. But let's just lay it out there. Why is the church complex? Why is it going to be hard to live in community? Well, the first reason that I want you to see is that the church is intended to be a complex gathering of people. The church is supposed to be made up of young and old, rich and poor, educated, non-educated, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. It's to be made up of those who are managers and those who are not. Those who are weak in faith and those who are strong in faith. There are, the church is supposed to be made up of people who are not like you. And here's the thing. To belong to the church doesn't mean we all try to make ourselves the same. It doesn't mean that everybody, those who are poor have to become rich. Those who are not educated have to become educated. Those who are culturally different have to conform to the culture of someone else. And when that's the case, when we don't force everyone to be the same, it gets messy. It's hard. People have different preferences for food and clothes, where to deliver your baby. People have pref- differences in, of politics. There are a lot of things that can separate us. And here's what happens. When the pressure of that, when the difficulty of that hits, what do we do? We often retreat to our own corner and we find people like us. People who are like us are much easier to love and much easier to deal with. It's funny to me, I've always found this passage funny in, in Ephesians. Paul writes, Be patient and bear with one another, and forgive one another. He literally is saying, put up with one another and forgive each other. Why does he say this? Because the church is complex. He's utterly realistic about how hard it is going to be. You don't have to be patient and forgive those who don't offend you. But he's calling us to this because he knows it's going to be hard. It's always going to be difficult. But not only that, not only is the church made up of a complexity of people, but you are guaranteed when you enter the church to meet a group of sinners. Can't escape it, no matter how hard you try, because you carry it. We're all sinners. We're all toxically inward focused. We all moralize our preferences. We are all bent towards building our own kingdom and reputation. We can't escape the fact that the church is full of sinners and we sin against each other. Look, I don't want to minimize, please, I do not want to minimize the pain you have, made, have experienced in church, the sin that you have experienced against you. After the service, we can come and we can share scars. Look, when I was 17, 
It was, I was raised by a single mom. It was my mom, me, and my younger brother. And we loved Jesus, and we were serving in the church, and the church we were in started preaching something that was against the gospel. They started saying, if, only if you read a certain version of the Bible can you be a true Christian. And we're like, whoa, that's not the gospel. And we started to ask questions and say, hey, there's something wrong here. What happened to us? We were excommunicated. I lost my best friend through that. I know church can be a messy, sinful, messed up place, and it hurts deeply. And I'm not minimizing that, but I, I, I want you to understand that you cannot escape the fact that you will be sinned against. Hopefully not that, that extreme. There's no excuse for that. It does not excuse this. But it's going to happen. You're going to be sinned against. Look, I'm still getting to know you. And those of you that become my friends and close friends, I'm going to sin against you. I don't intend to, and I hope it's not badly and intentionally, and I will have to repent and ask for your forgiveness. But it's going to happen. Your pastors will sin. You will sin. Your friends will sin against you. And it makes the church difficult. It makes things hard. And here's another aspect when we build a culture of grace, it frees us to open up our hearts and spill out the junk. And oftentimes we have more junk in our hearts than we realize. And so when, as we dig deeper, more stuff comes out and more sin comes out. And so as a church, if we're doing things correctly, sin is going to be exposed and we're going to see a lot of it. And it's going to make things messy. But here's one of my fears I know I've been this person and still can be this person. One of two things happens. One, you either think you're too sinful and messy to be part of the church, so you, you retreat, you pull back. If people really knew what you were like, if people really knew the extent of your sin, they would disown you, they would shun you, they would turn your ba- their back on you. And so you retreat and you pull back. Friends, let me remind you, of the gospel, if that's you, remind you that Jesus Christ has forgiven all your sin. He paid for it with his blood, all of it. When he said it is finished, he meant it. And so if you are right with God, it frees you to open your hearts and share your sin and receive the grace of God, receive the grace of other people in your life. Let them speak truth to you. Let them help you. Let them hold you accountable and walk with you. That is what the gospel does. But my bigger fear is that there are those of you in here that are performing. You you come into church with your best foot forward. You, You put on your best in front of other people because though you know the gospel, you're still trusting and putting your confidence in your own performance. You think God loves you and likes you because you keep your spiritual disciplines, because you avoid the big sins. And let's be honest, they're not that hard to avoid. But inside, inside, you're like an overworked boiler ready to burst. And we see this, this happens when those people sin against you and you re- respond in anger and frustration and impatience, when those that are in your gospel community aren't growing as fast as you think they should be, and you've been having conversations with people and it's like the third week in a row you're talking about this and you're like, man, why don't you just get over yourself and change? Or if someone pushes on something and kind of pokes at a sin, you jump back as something bit you. Because you... You, you have built this persona that you think you have to guard and, and hold up and protect. Friends, if that's you, let me remind you of the gospel. One, God does not accept you and love you because of your performance. You could never keep the law. That's why Jesus came. Paul makes that very clear. If we could be righteous following the law, Christ wouldn't have had to come. But hear the love of God for you in that. Receive his grace. Drop the act. Repent and receive grace. And if you are in a place of strength, praise God for that. 
Your brothers and sisters in Christ who are weak need you. Now, what I don't want to do is create this sense of here's God's purpose in the church. We see the centrality of it. And then we see the complexity and the mess of it. And I don't want us just to go, okay, I get it. It's going to be hard. It's going to be messy. I'm just going to grip my teeth and endure. That's not what I want us to see. What I want us to see this morning is this, that when God's purposes and our sin collide, what's produced is not despair, but beauty. Something very beautiful happens. So I want to talk about the beauty of the church. I'm glad Dana quoted C.S. Lewis this morning because I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis as well. That's, that's the things the Spirit does with people when you don't even talk and you're connecting. In his book, The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis talks about how sacrificial, redemptive love transforms someone that is unlovely into something very beautiful. And so what I want us to see, the first reason that the church is beautiful and we should see that the church is beautiful is because the church is radically loved by Christ. This is what C.S. Lewis writes. He says, For the church has not beauty, but what the bridegroom gives her. He does not find, but makes her lovely. Christ sees in the flawed, proud, fanatical, or lukewarm church on earth that bride who will one day be without spot or wrinkle and labors to produce the latter. Have you considered how much Christ loves his church? That he purchased her with his own blood and he washes and purifies her. You, us, he's done that. You are radically loved. And there's only one word that can be described when Christ loves us rebellious, proud, stubborn sinners with that kind of sacrificial, radical, life-giving love. That's beautiful. I don't know how else to describe it, but beautiful. And if God's love towards us is beautiful, what effect does it have on us? It makes us beautiful. He sees us as beautiful. We have a beauty given to us. It's not, don't look for it in yourself. Don't look for it in yourself. Find it in God's love for you. See what he has done and what he is doing. So the church is beautiful because she is loved. Second, the church is beautiful because she is complex. Think about this. Where else in this world are you going to find people that radically different coming together in unity? Yeah, I know we fail at this, sometimes miserably. We can look around and think, man, in some ways we all look the same, we may act the same. There might be a lot of sameness here. But that doesn't change the fact that God's vision and God's intention is that we wrap our arms around, wrap our arms around this entire city, entire world, and call people who are radically different, very different, to the same community to live in unity. Where else is that going to happen? Look, political systems aren't going to cause that to happen. Education Rezoning and gentrification are not going to cause that to happen. Only the gospel can bring two people who would normally be at odds with one another and bring them together to live in unity and they can celebrate the differences. They can uplift and honor differences. Church, the past six months to a year, I think, has shown us that there are some deep, deep divisions in our country among rich and poor, black and white. Where is the world going to go to see a model of community that lives in unity, if not the church? We're taking a big hit for our faith, especially on our stance when it comes to human sexuality. But if that's all we're focusing on, we're missing something else, that we have a profound moment in our nation's history, in our cultural moment, to speak something into our divided country and say, the gospel brings people together, brings people who are different together to live in unity, not by squashing difference, but by celebrating difference. Because in Jesus Christ, there is no Jew or Greek, 
There's no slave or free. There's no male or female. All are one in Christ. That is a beautiful picture that we can hold to the world. We live in a segregated city, right? And what better way to display the gospel than by embracing difference here at Coram Deo? So the church is beautiful because she is complex. And then thirdly, the church is beautiful because the Holy Spirit's at work. And we can focus so much on the junk, focus so much on the sin, that we miss in our gospel communities, in our families, in our relationships, the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit in what he is doing. Think of this that those men who at one time were slaves to lust and anger and selfishness are now self-controlled, dignified, sound in faith and love. That's a beautiful work of the Holy Spirit. That women who are prone to maybe gossip and backbiting and undermining their husband's authority are now kind, pure, loving their husbands and their kids and serving them. Those who were once crushed by guilt and remorse over their sin are set free and they know joy and they know peace. Those who once lived in conflict and fought are now living in harmony, deep, real, true harmony. There are stories of marriages being transformed in this church. Do you see the beauty of the Holy Spirit at work among you? Don't miss it. When you're in gospel community and you see people wrestling through issues, but you see the Spirit transforming them, that is a very beautiful thing. There is much beauty in our midst, even in the midst of our brokenness. I mean, those that have been beat up by circumstances can be welcomed in by the church and supported and cared for that's beautiful. Those who have felt outcast and alone can know acceptance and love from both God and a church family. Those that fight despair and depression, the fact that you continue to get out of bed and you keep moving forward in hope and faith, no matter how small that is, that's the Holy Spirit. And that is such a beautiful thing. In church, I hope you saw the beautiful work of the Spirit in Sarah's testimony, that she could cry out to God in the midst of pain and grief with faith, asking questions, but she continues just to go forward in faith. That's the Spirit working in her. If you do not see the beauty in that, check your pulse. God is doing some amazing things in the church, beautiful things in the church, both in you and through you. That is his intention for us. So see the beauty of the church. So just a couple points of application in closing. First, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, this is a call. Join the church. Believe in Christ. Put your faith in Christ. Turn from your sin and know forgiveness and acceptance and be part of the people of God that he is saving. Second, love the church. Christ loves his bride, loves the church. And the only thing that will cause us to love the church is when we reflect upon how much Jesus loves us and loves his people. So go deeper in your understanding of what God has done. See what he is accomplishing in his church and through his church and grow in your love for the church. And finally, give yourself to the church. God's intended context for your discipleship is the local church. So give yourself to the local church. It doesn't have to be Coram Deo. There are other great gospel preaching, gospel centered churches in Omaha, but give yourself to a local church. Join and be discipled and disciple others. Be on mission in this city. But if you are being called to Coram Deo, if you're being called to make this church your home, give yourself to this local church. Maybe that means jumping into gospel community and you need to deepen your sense of community with others that 
they may speak truth into your life and you may speak truth into others' lives and you may walk alongside people in friendship and serve them and care for them. Maybe it's committing as a member to this church. Now, membership, you can get, it's can, it's kind of scary when you start talking about membership, right? Like, what, are they, what does that mean? What do I got to do? What do I got to sign? Where's the, you know, small language? But here's the thing. Christ has called us to commit, and that's how commitment is expressed. It would make no sense to me to say I'm committed to Mindy if I wasn't married to her. And so that commitment of membership shows you're all in. And so maybe that's the next step you need to take, is commit yourself. Maybe you're nailing community. Maybe you're nailing the discipleship thing. You're giving yourself to other people. You're speaking truth into other people's lives. You're open with your own issues and people are speaking into your life. But maybe you just need to get your hands dirty. Maybe you need to serve in some way, whether it be children's ministry or setup or other, other opportunities where it's like just that tangible hands-on service. But whatever it may be, wherever God is dealing with you in that, give yourself to the church. Christ has given himself. Let us give ourselves to what he died for. We have an amazing God who's doing something very beautiful in and through the church. Let us love what he loves. Let us grow as disciples together in this local church so that we can proclaim the glory of our Savior to the city and see him bring gospel renewal. Amen? Let's pray. Just want to take just a short time of silence and just reflect, reflecting, go before the Lord and just hear from the Lord. Where is it that he's pressing on you? Where is it that you need to give yourself to the church? Whether it be to join the church, whether it may be to deepen your love for the church or maybe to give yourself more deeply to this local church or another. So however the Lord is leading you, just spend some time praying and reflecting